In today's video, I have 18 tips that are really going to improve your drawing ability fast. Welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, my name is Michelle and on this channel, we do all things watercolor, all things drawing and lots of mixed media and motivation for artists too. Please do consider subscribing. Unlike most channels on YouTube, we are fully cat approved. Now here on YouTube, I've got some very specific drawing videos about drawing specific things. This video is going to be a little bit broader and we're looking at broader concepts. We're going to start with some tips to do with materials, move on to some practical drawing tips and end with one or two motivational tips. These are more about mindset. And the last one I have for you today is just three words. And if you say these three words to yourself before you start every single drawing, it's going to 100% improve your results. Keep watching to the end of the video to find out what those three important words are. For tip number one, we're going to choose better paper. So let's talk about the quality of paper. Now, this is the paper that I'm using in my studio at the moment. To be clear, this video is not sponsored. I'm not advertising this or any other paper. There are many good brands of paper available. This is a great one. There's a couple of things you want to look for. The first thing you want to look for is this GSM number. So the higher this is, the thicker and heavier the paper and the lower it is, the thinner the paper. So this one is 220 GSM. So it's grams per square meter. They basically work it out by weight of a square meter of paper. You don't need to worry about how they work it out. Just remember the higher this number, the thicker and heavier the paper is. Obviously, a thicker paper is likely to be a higher quality. It can be a little lighter than this. It can be a little bit heavier, but you don't want really thin paper. So as well as the weight, you want to look out for paper that's very shiny. So this is some of the paper that I just showed you. This is my Frisk paper. It's got quite a nice weight to it. It's quite hefty. It's going to stand up well to erasing, to turning the paper, to sticking it down. It's going to be nice and solid. I'm not going to go through it the second I put an eraser on it. This is a piece of printer paper. You can see it's much cheaper. What you can't feel is the fact that this one is much smoother and that's not necessarily a good thing. So all drawing paper should feel smooth, but this one has got more of a tooth on it and you actually get some that are even shinier than this. So if you've got a paper that's shinier, what's going to happen is there's not enough texture, enough tooth on it to grab the graphite from your pencil. So let's look what happens when I sketch. First of all, on the Frisk paper, and we've got a nice application there. We can see some texture, some tiny gaps, and that's good because it's helping to grab the paper. There are ways of smoothing that out. If we look at this one here, and I'm not really pressing any more lightly, it just looks like it because there isn't much tooth on this paper, and so I'm never going to be able to get really dark marks on a thin, cheap, shiny paper. So my next tip is not to spend too much on paper. So tip number two is don't pay more than you need to for paper. So we've talked about the importance of using good quality paper when you're doing a proper drawing rather than just, you know, a little bit of practice, which we'll talk about later in this video. But when you're doing a proper drawing, you want to spend as little as possible on getting that good quality paper. Now, my advice always used to be to buy loose sheets online. Here in the UK, it can be as much as four times cheaper than buying a pad of paper from an art store but I have been told that that's not the case in all parts of the world. So if you're somewhere that's got really a uh, comprehensive distribution system, it's really easy just to, you know, put in an Amazon order or buy from a large art manufacturer somewhere like America or UK or Europe, then you are going to find that buying loose sheets, drawing paper online in a big batch and cutting them down as you need to is going to be your cheapest option. However, if you live somewhere a little bit more far flung, perhaps you're on a tiny island in the middle of nowhere, then you aren't going to find that that's a cheaper option for you. You may find that it's impossible or at least very expensive to order from one of these online retailers, in which case you may find that your local shop has the cheaper deal. But certainly here in Europe and probably in America as well, you are going to find some real bargains if you shop online. For tip number three, you need to use the right pencil. Now, if you're completely new to drawing, you may just have grabbed an HB pencil. Now you can occasionally use these for art, but that's not really what they're meant for. So let's have a look now at pencil grades. 
if you've got a pencil laying around your house, the chances are it's an HB. So HB stands for hard black or hard bold. I think I've been using this one to open a tube of paint. And it's a pencil really that's designed mostly for writing and for things like plotting. There are harder pencils than this to be sure. Pencils that start with H or F. And generally I would avoid all of those for art. They're designed for things like writing, for draftsmanship, for map making, for plotting things generally. The harder a pencil is, the lighter the marks will appear. Now that can be an advantage and you certainly can use an HB pencil just for putting light marks on your paper. The problem with a hard pencil like this is it's likely to dent the paper. So even if you erase this line, you can find that you end up with a dip in your paper which can come back to haunt you later. It'll show up as you sketch across the top of it. As I said, there are occasional uses for an HB pencil within making art. I sometimes use one for plotting out very light botanical studies in watercolour. But generally speaking, for sketching, you want to use the B grades. So I've got this nice set of Faber-Castell here. It starts on 2B and it goes up in increments to a 12B. So we haven't got everyone here. We've got 2B and then we've got 4B. We don't have 3B, which, um, you know, you can get those. So looking at these B pencils, let's try the 2B. So it's a little darker than this one here. We can't initially see much difference, but you will find that it's much better for shading compared to the HB, which is going to give much harder marks. But as we go up the B grades, this one's a 6B, we'll start being able to get much darker, softer effects. I've got a 10B here. Now some ranges only go up to an 8 or 9B. This one is great, it goes up to 12B. And you'll see that the higher the B number, the softer and darker. They can be less accurate and they can smudge more. But when you want those real dark marks to get a full range of tonal values, you're going to want the B grades. They're much more suitable for sketching than an HB pencil. Now, whether you're a complete beginner or you're very experienced at drawing, you're going to need to, to rub things out, to erase things. So next, we're going to select the right eraser. Let's talk about erasers. If you just use the eraser on your end of your pencil or one that's lying around your house, you likely find that they're far too hard. They'll tend just to move the pencil around the paper without removing it. They will be very smudgy. The eraser I'm using in my studio at the moment is a Winsor & Newton medium kneaded putty rubber. You can see that I've cut this one up and that's because these are quite expensive. So I tend to buy a large one and then chop it into smaller pieces. There's a piece here I've been using and these will lift out your mistakes nicely. I tend to avoid the putty rubbers that are very, very soft and sticky and look more like that blue tack stuff that you put posters up with. I like a firm or a medium putty eraser. Another one I really like is the De La Roni Firm. You're going to get a great result with the right eraser. For tip number five, we're going to keep our paper clean. You must have had the situation where everything starts getting a bit smudgy and a bit messy. We've all got oil naturally in our skin. It's best to keep it off the paper. I'm gonna give you a couple of strategies now for keeping your paper clean. I used to teach a lot of in-person art classes and how many times did I see when I was walking around my art class, somebody had got some eraser droppings on their paper and they were doing this. Absolutely disgusting, getting all the oil from their hands on their paper, smudging everything up. What you want to do is use a brush like this. So if you get any little bits of eraser on your paper and you'll get far less of them with a putty eraser than one of those hard erasers, you can just brush them off like this. This is actually a makeup brush. I got free with something. I thought it was absolutely useless, but it's great for getting eraser droppings off of my paper. You can also use any flat paintbrush. The other thing to watch out for is leaning on your paper. So you're working on a large area and you're leaning like this. We've all ended up, haven't we, with that pencil on our hands. You can avoid that completely by just leaning on a piece of paper towel while you're working. Tip number six is not to draw in dotted lines. Let me explain what I mean. Beginners are often very frightened of making mistakes and putting hard lines down that they can't get rid of later. So they'll tend to draw in dotted lines. So if they're drawing a leaf, they'll tend to do something like this. 
The problem with this is you end up with a very stilted result. It simply doesn't flow and it's not actually very accurate. Another time people will do it is when they're trying to do a circle or an ellipse, maybe at the top of a jam jar, and they'll end up doing this. And not only do they end up with a shape that's completely wonky, but they'll end up with a hard corner, which you never actually get on an ellipse, and it all starts to go wrong. I want you to be much freer. Draw sometimes from the shoulder with very light marks like this. This is why we have an eraser so that we can erase the parts that don't work for us. And when you're drawing things that flow like botanicals or animals, you want to allow your pencil to flow. Even if the mark is a little bit inaccurate, it's going to look so much more natural if you just make a free flowing shape rather than trying to go round in tiny little dots. Tip number seven is that using a grid is better than using tracing paper. Now, no one should be shamed for using tracing paper. It's not wrong, it's certainly not evil, but it doesn't allow you really to improve your drawing skills. Whereas using a grid method, and there are several types of grid methods, using a grid method means that you still have to draw by eye. So if you do need a little bit of help with your layout, and I am planning actually on doing a video later this spring on different types of ways of transferring your image onto the paper and getting it accurate, let me know in the comments if you're interested in that one. But using one of these grid methods means you still have to draw by eye and it's going to train your brain to be more accurate, something that tracing paper will never do. For tip number eight, we're going to look at using tracing paper, not to mindlessly transfer an image, but actually as a learning tool that's going to help improve our natural drawing skills. And incidentally, if you're interested in the grid technique, have a look in the description of this video, or I'll link a couple of videos down there that I made all about various types of grid techniques that you can use. But now we're going to look at using tracing paper actually as a learning device. So I've got some boats here in this photograph. Boats can be really tricky. They've got straight edges, they've got curves, they've got angles. There's also here a lot of foreshortening and we're looking at these shapes from above. It can be quite hard to sort of pass what's going on with them. Now I don't wanna just trace them because I won't improve my drawing if I do that. But what I can do is I can trace the shape and then still draw it by eye. So if I just can't figure out how something looks, say the top of this little boat here, I can't figure out how deep it is. That foreshortening is, I'm finding it so hard to understand. What I can do is I can trace this shape and then rather than transfer it to my paper, I can just look at it and give myself an idea and think to myself, oh, I understand now. I see how it looks. I see that this side is a lot sort of more curved and a steeper angle. And then this side comes round like this. And this bit is straight and I've got a small part here and a small part here. So rather than being distracted by everything that's going on here, I've used the tracing paper to isolate the shape and help me to start getting the drawing right. It might not be 100%, but it's fantastic practice. And I've allowed that tracing to give me a really useful tool to show me how to draw my boat without doing everything for me. Just before we jump into our next drawing tip, can I just quickly ask you please to like this video, to give it a thumbs up. If you like, share, subscribe, or leave me a comment, YouTube will push this video out to more people. I can help more people like you learn to draw. And don't forget that if you need more help, I actually have a full online drawing course. It has many, many five-star reviews. I'll pop a link to that in the video description. So you can have a look at that after you've finished watching this video, if that's something you think would help you. Tip number nine is to use the envelope technique. Now, I did a whole video all about using the envelope technique, so I'm only gonna speak about it briefly today. What I'll do is I'll link to that video at the end of this video, so once you've watched all of this video, you'll be able to go and watch that one next. But the envelope technique basically explained is drawing sort of a box around a shape. So whether you're drawing a vase or a person, or a building is the idea of drawing sort of a straight sided box around your object. I'll put a picture up so you can see what that looks like. This is yet another way of helping you to get more accuracy. So tip number 10 is don't outline non-solid objects. Now it's often said that there are no lines in real life, that things aren't outlined. 
there is just light and dark, tone and mass, different objects. They're not all outlined. I wouldn't always agree with that. There certainly are some things in life that do have outlines. But one thing that you never want to do when you're drawing is to outline non-solid objects. So what do I mean by that? I mean things like clouds, shadows and particularly water reflections. If you've ever drawn a water reflection and you've perhaps you've got a building reflected in the water and you've drawn an outline around it, it starts to look like it's not water at all. It starts to look like a solid object. So this is the problem with outlining non-solid objects. You start to make them look like more physical solid objects. So if you're ever doing something like clouds, shadows, reflections, you want to just sketch and shade the shapes roughly blend out the edges, don't outline them, otherwise they're not going to look realistic. Tip number 11 is to practice drawing areas of texture. So you may have been drawing something and you come to an area, say it's you know lots of leaves on a tree or an area of brickwork, maybe some grasses or some grass, perhaps some gravel or concrete, and you just kind of get stuck and you think, I've no idea how to make the pencil look like this thing because it's very detailed and I can't see all of it. I can't see every blade of grass, every leaf, every piece of gravel, and yet I need to make it look like this from a distance. So let's look at how we would practice doing this. I'm also considering making a longer video giving you some actual tutorials for different types of textures. Let me know in the comments if that's something you'd like to see. And let's look at how we practice creating texture. So practicing textures can be a really great idea. You could even build up a little sort of library of different textures. It's great to practice sometimes when you're not doing a full drawing and just think about how you might portray these in a larger drawing. So maybe I'm doing some bricks and I'm just gonna have sort of a bit of an experiment and think to myself, you know, how am I actually going to get those textures looking right. I can try different things out. Do I just fill in like this? What about some cross hatching? Or perhaps I'm going to go for a much more broken approach because we all have these areas of texture that we need to figure out. And whether it's brickwork or wood or gravel, we need to get to grip with textures so that we've got sort of a full arsenal of techniques we can use in our larger drawings. Tip number 12 is something that all professional artists do, and that's to use blending tools. Now, don't worry, you don't need to buy anything special. You'll already have some of these in your house. There are others that you might want to invest in. They're so much more effective and so much better for the paper than using your fingers. Let's look at some blending tools next. Now, if you want to get professional results, you're going to want to use blending tools. So there are lots that you can buy. There are also some that you will already have in your house. This is a torsion. This is a paper stump. These are very useful. You can see what it does is it pushes everything into the dips. So where we had that lovely texture on our drawing paper, we can now push this around and make a smoother effect. Other tools that you can use include paint brushes. This one is much more subtle, very good for doing things like portraits and blending tiny things, maybe something like the center of an eye, just getting that smoothness. I've also got a Derwent blending tool here. These are great as well. This is a much firmer point and you sharpen it just like a pencil. Something else that's great for really large soft areas is a cosmetic tissue like this. You can just fold it a couple of times, wrap it around your finger and you can use that to smudge and blend. Imagine how effective this would be for clouds and you can, as you can see with most of the blending tools, you can actually pick up graphite from one part of the drawing and deposit it on another. Absolutely wonderful for molding shadows, for faces, for clouds. Blending tools are going to give you the results you're looking for. For tip number 13, we're going to use the eraser to create soft highlights. This is something that sometimes beginners don't think of doing. It's really, really effective. Now, reserving light areas can be quite tricky. Of course, you can draw around them. But one of the things that you can do is use your eraser to lift out a highlight. And the good thing about this is you'll get a really soft highlight. So what we can do here is we can just lift out. It doesn't remove all of the pencil, but it's giving that soft highlighted shape. And again, over here, you're going to get a much more natural looking effect than you could ever get 
just by leaving a white gap. Tip number 14 is another professional artist trick. Once you've seen it, you'll never go back and that's to use an embossing tool. This is an embossing tool. You can get nail art tools very cheaply that are pretty much the same thing. It's basically a point with a little ball on the end, so it's not going to cut your paper because it's not sharp, but it is going to make a dent in your paper. You can also, if you don't have one of these, use a ballpoint pen without any ink in it. If you've got a ballpoint pen that's run out of ink, that makes a great embossing tool. So what do you use it for? You use it for fine white lines. You can actually use it also in watercolor painting. It has a different effect there. It'll give you a dark line in watercolour painting but when it comes to drawing it'll give you a light line so what we're doing is we're denting the paper then I'm going to sketch across and look at this result absolutely magical so if I'm building up textures of grasses or fur of course there are many other things that you can use it for but it's going to give you those fine white lines that you can't possibly reserve by hand Tip number 15 is to look for twice as long as you draw. This was advice that was given to me when I started learning to draw. And it's such good advice because you can't hope to draw something accurately if you don't understand it. Now, when I say understand it, I don't mean that you need to look at a scene and, you know, understand two and three and four point perspective. Because all you have to do really is draw accurately what you see and the perspective will be correct if you get all the angles the same as what you're looking at. But if you don't even understand the angles and the way something looks, then you really can't draw it accurately. If you're drawing flowers, for example, you don't really know, you know how the, uh, the flower is structured. You want to spend some time actually figuring that out before you start drawing. I think we've all got to the point with uh, drawing when we've really got into the drawing, we've been sketching and sketching and shading and shading, and we end up looking less and less at our source material. Whether that's real life or a photograph, you just end up head down and you're deep in the weeds and you just keep drawing and drawing and drawing. Try to remember to spend a lot more time looking, certainly when you're a beginner, than you do drawing. Tip number 16 is to draw something every day without expectation. Now, if you were learning to do anything, whether that's horse riding or baking or some other skill, you wouldn't expect to get it right every time. So why do you expect that every time you sit down with a sketch pad, why do you put this expectation on yourself to create a really good finished drawing? When you're a beginner, it just doesn't work that way. So I want you to draw something once a day, as well as that sort of practice, I want you to draw something once a day without any expectation of it being a finished piece. In fact, I've got a couple of strategies for you that are going to mean that it absolutely won't end up as a good drawing. It's just drawing practice. You're not going to put any pressure on yourself. Let me show you how to do this. So let's do an exercise every single day of spending five minutes sketching. What are you going to sketch? The first thing you see. So we just sit in your house somewhere and sketch what you see. Now you can sketch the room as a whole and sometimes you can sketch just the things you see up close to you, maybe on a table. Now I want you to absolutely ensure that this drawing is nothing. This drawing is not going to be kept. You're not even going to try and make it a beautiful finished drawing. You're going to in fact scupper your results by choosing some cheap rubbish paper, back of an envelope, something like that. You're going to draw in pen. A ballpoint pen like this is actually really great for drawing but of course you're not going to be able to erase your mistakes. You're also not going to draw in your best sketchbook where you might sort of you might have these preconceptions that, you know, every page should look a little bit smart and you're just going to draw what you see in front of you. Now, what I can see in front of me at the moment off camera is a mug that I had some tea in earlier. It's um, very sadly hasn't got any tea in anymore, but I can still use it for drawing practice. And um, what we're doing is, you know, we're just getting an idea of the shape of something. We're going to leave all of the mistakes in and we're just going to start drawing everything that we can see. And by doing this, you're just going to be getting your eye in every single day. My mug actually has a picture of a cat on. It's sort of a sort of a cartoon cat. Well, not cartoon so much as, as, as graphic. And it has words on it. And the words say, not today, patriarchy. Um, it's given to me by... A friend of mine and there are some leaves around the cat it's also got a little wreath on and here it is 
So every single day, I just want you to practice drawing what you can see in front of you by spending five minutes a day just drawing the nearest thing to you with a scruffy old piece of paper and a pen that you can't erase is going to take away all of that pressure for producing a nice finished drawing. But every single day you're going to be getting better at observation. You're going to be thinking about the depth of this ellipse. Have we got that right? Is it deep enough? Is the handle okay? Should it be a little bit broader here? We can even, if we want to, do a little bit of shading and start thinking about getting an idea of the edges curving away from us. We can put some shading in here and start observing where is the shadow deeper. It's actually deeper on this inside edge here. Drawing every day without expectation of results will improve your hand-to-eye coordination and your accuracy. Tip number 17 is to avoid limiting self-talk. Now, if I said to you, did you see that sports match? Did you see that boxing match where the chap went in and he said, you know, I really don't think I've got much chance of winning this boxing match. I'm really worried about the other guy. He's so much bigger than me. I just don't think I stand a chance. Have you ever heard a sports person of any kind talk like that before going into a match? Absolutely not. They would never do it. Something that sports people understand and indeed businessmen understand is that the way you talk to yourself matters. And if you are constantly saying to yourself or to other people or even just in your own head, if you're constantly saying to yourself, I can't draw, I'm not very good at drawing, other people in my family draw better than me, I'll never be any good at drawing. If you constantly say this stuff to you, then you're pretty much ensuring that you won't ever be any good at drawing. Now, some of you know that in my spare time, I actually take part in martial arts classes and I'm an instructor now. And one of the things that my instructors used to say to me when I was training and I now say to students is that when they say they can't do something, I make them add the word yet. I can't do a shoulder roll, Michelle. You can't do a shoulder roll yet. You can learn to do a shoulder roll. I can't draw cars. This is something I said to myself, really don't like drawing cars. I would say to myself, I can't draw cars. What did I actually mean? I meant that I find drawing cars really difficult. I've never quite got the hang of it. It's not a subject I enjoy. So stop telling yourself that you can't draw at all or that you can't draw certain things. All human beings can draw, all children can draw. It's just a matter of skill level and of gradual improvement. It's not black and white. It's not all or nothing. It's not, I can draw or I can't draw. You are on a journey of learning to draw and gradually improving. You'll be better at drawing some things and not so good at others. And you can draw and you can learn to draw. So I want you to change the way you talk about your drawing abilities, both to yourself and out loud to other people. I want you to say things like, I am learning to draw. I'm trying to improve my drawing. I'm studying drawing cars so that I can get better at it. Tip number 18, we talked about at the start of the video, three words that are going to improve your drawings every single time. Those words are layout before detail. Let me explain this and show you practically how to do it. So let's talk about layout before detail. Something that beginners do that children also do when they're starting to draw is they start with the detail. So I've got a picture here of a statue in some gardens. There are mountains behind. My friend actually took this. I haven't been here. It's somewhere in France. I think it's called Ease. And I did actually paint a picture of this statue once. I'd love to go there because the gardens are apparently full of cacti. And I do love a good cactus. So what beginners would do would start drawing this statue and they would probably start with the face and then work out with the body. The difficulty with this is you've no idea how big or small it's going to be. This can be compounded by working on paper that's bigger or smaller than your image. So what you need to do is get control over the image and you want to do the layout first. You're going to think to yourself, how do I get all of this onto the paper without cutting anything off? And what I would start by doing is thinking to myself, well, I don't want the top of the head to go outside of my paper. So I'll make a mark here and I'll say top of the head is going no higher than this. And then I'll be thinking about whereabouts the actual statue is going to be and maybe even making some lines for the shape of the body. And you see here that I'm not really drawing anything yet. I am just getting an idea 
of what layout I want on my paper. And the head is going to be here, and we've got the body coming down here somewhere. So you see, we're doing shapes at the moment, no detail whatsoever. There's this tall tree behind. So where's this going to come? Maybe it's going to come about here. So I can put in some marks for that and I'll just take a triangular mark up where the top is going to be. What about this line of the horizon? Anything that's got a horizon in, that's a very good place to start, is putting that horizon in where you want it. And then what do I want down here? I'm going to get some of these spiky bushes around here. So what we've got now is we've got some very primitive marks, but I know that I can get the statue on my paper from top to bottom, and I've got all of the main elements in place. Starting with the detail can be so disheartening because you can do a fabulous job of a beautiful face, a beautiful animal, a fantastic building, and then you can just find that it's in the wrong place. It's far too far over to the left or right. A bit of it goes off the paper, the composition isn't any good, and all of that detail that you put in, all of that work was for nothing. So before every single painting, say to yourself, layout before detail. So in a moment, I'm going to put that link up for you to my envelope drawing technique. You're going to find it so useful. But before you leave this video, don't forget to have a look in the video description. I've got lots more drawing tutorials some of which I've spoken about in this video. I'll put the links down below so that you can watch those later. You'll also find lots of free stuff down there, including some free downloadable PDFs. There's even some free courses that you can take. If you need much more structured help, don't forget that I have a full online drawing course. It's my most popular course. It has many, many five-star reviews. I'll pop a link to that one in the video description as well. And why not watch my envelope drawing technique video next?